Hello, this is Dr. Anthony Delmond. When we left off, we were walking through the agricultural supply chain. Uh, we want to go back now and start talking about some of those supply chain members, in particular, the middlemen. There are certainly more middlemen than we'll discuss in this section, but it's a good idea to at least talk about some of the important ones. Processors physically alter the product from, a, from the raw goods that are provided by producers. There are innumerable examples, like canning peaches, as we saw before, but also things like turning berries into jam, or processing wheat into bread and frozen pizzas. Uh, wholesalers repackage products. I typically think about the apple market, having lived out in Washington, where wholesalers buy in bulk from many orchards and bundle the products for sale to grocery stores all over the country. Retailers include those grocery stores, but also co-ops and other places that sell directly to end users of the product, uh, what we call the final customer, the person who's going to use it at the end. There are several other middlemen, uh, for example, agent middlemen, who never take physical responsibility for products but facilitate trade. Those are people like brokers. They don't alter the product or repackage it. So they're different from traditional wholesalers, uh, and they don't sell to uh, end users typically. So they're not going to actually take control of the product, whereas wholesalers and retailers typically do. And obviously processors do because they're changing what the product is. Depending on the organizational structure, the supply chain structure, and uh, where salespeople fit in the supply chain, sales possessions can be very different. Uh, we'll start with a retail setting like a grocery store or a clothing outlet. Uh, people there, uh, salespeople there, typically wait for customers to arrive and purchase products. The responsibility for connecting people with products is really on the customer. So those jobs typically don't pay as much. Uh, and we refer to those salespeople as order takers because they sit and they wait for customers to give an order. So they're just taking them. Uh, fast food goes along the same lines. On the other hand, when salespeople have to go out and find customers for their products, uh, as is common in the upstream markets, uh, we refer to those salespeople as order getters. They make more money because they bring in more money for the companies they represent. One thing I'd like to note, going back to our supply chain slide, is that upstream and downstream are important concepts in this text, uh, in this course. Uh, the supply chain is made up of uh, a sort of range of uh, services, uh, shall we say. So growers are typically viewed as being at the top of the supply chain, even though we have, as I said before, people that supply them as well. Uh, downstream from them are the processors, wholesalers, retailers, and customers. So each of these lines that we see in this diagram uh, is going to represent a move from an upstream uh, supply chain member to a downstream supply chain member. So for example, processors are downstream from the growers, and retailers are downstream in that supply chain from those processors. Retailers are also downstream from growers. There are two clicks downstream, or two, two uh, shifts downstream. We won't get into counting those, but uh, you can determine the depth of a supply chain by the number of nodes between the initial supply chain member and the end user. Uh, retailers are downstream from wholesalers, typically. Uh, for example, look in that top part there where we have peaches. Uh, Customers are downstream from retailers. So it's good to understand that upstream and downstream verbiage. It's also notable uh, that typically, though it's not always the case, salespeople in the upstream markets earn more because they're selling in bulk, so their commissions are larger than if they're selling at the lower end. Obviously, we also have a lot more order takers once you get to the downstream supply chain members. Among order getters, we have many types. We could talk about a few here, but again, we won't talk about everything. Door-to-door -door sales are the simplest to discuss because we all have a pretty good idea what this looks like. A salesperson's out canvassing the neighborhood looking for potential buyers. We think about the Fuller Brush men. Uh, but door-to-door -door sales is more than that. Uh, since it can happen in a multitude of settings, it can happen business to business, uh, business to customer, and so on. But it's the same process, finding a potential buyer by reaching out. Missionary sales is a little different. In that case, sellers are reaching out to individuals with influence over others. 
It's similar to pyramid selling or pyramid schemes uh, in that one person could benefit from the number of converts that he or she gets to sell a product for them. So uh, it can be lucrative for everyone. It's not illegal uh, like pyramid selling is. Um, the most common place we see this is in pharmaceutical sales where drug reps convince doctors to sell or prescribe certain products uh, for the people that will actually be the end users. Uh, it's something we also see sometimes in the market for agricultural inputs. Sales engineers are those that work to develop goods and services that will help customers. Uh, this is far more involved than just selling an existing product. It's all about customizing a product for an individual customer. We'll discuss that further in a future lecture. We'll also discuss consultative selling more in a future lecture. But uh, suffice to say here, it involves a form of partnership with the buyer. Uh, the salesperson is acting as a consultant, often sharing in the success or failure of the buyer's company. All right, so let's move on to a discussion of agricultural sales in the, in the U.S. Uh, we'll start out with two important statistics. We can kind of capture the size of U.S. agricultural sales uh, by looking at these two things, the number of farms and the number of related jobs. Regarding the number of farms, it's important to think about what kind of sales activities farm work involves. Every farm must sell all or most of its production to stay in business. Since it usually uh, doesn't sell directly to end users or household consumers, uh, it's creating additional sales jobs for all its downstream buyers. Additionally, farms use plenty of inputs, for example, seed, pesticides, and such from other agribusinesses. So the number of farms relates pretty strongly to the number of sales positions that are out there. Uh, in uh, 2019, the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimated that the U.S. had uh, a million and three quarters sales representatives in wholesale and manufacturing. There are plenty of agricultural sales jobs around the U.S. If we consider just the unfilled positions that are being advertised, and keep in mind, many jobs aren't advertised and the vast majority aren't vacant. Uh, but if we think about just the ones that are unfilled and advertised, we can mentally estimate how many jobs are out there at a given time. So these are just some quick data I compiled. Uh, I threw this one in the textbook, but it'll need to be updated uh, occasionally. This was collected during the pandemic, uh, so unemployment rates were a little bit on the high side. Uh, but again, at 5.8%, that's still only a small portion of the jobs that are actually filled. Uh, so looking at just agriculture, we can see that different search engines for ag careers uh, have lots and lots of jobs available. Uh, for sales, again, lots and lots of jobs, but for agricultural sales, uh, those are at least in the thousands uh, for most of these job aggregators. I haven't found any numbers uh, for how many jobs aren't advertised, but again, these are just the large, large aggregators. So these are going to be for uh, large-scale jobs or jobs that are for major companies. Uh, many sales jobs are collected through farms and, 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 and on a much smaller scale and aren't advertised on a big site like one of these. All right, so let's talk about a career in agricultural sales. The term agricultural sales representatives is really the title that's given to most salespeople in an agribusiness setting. Large seed and pesticide manufacturers like Bayer or Syngenta hire teams of sales reps to sell their products to individual farms. Um, Non-ag businesses uh, sell their products to uh, agricultural businesses all the time, uh, and they also employ sales reps for these tasks. Uh, for example, non-ag businesses like inventory software suppliers, human resource tools or services, and metal parts suppliers, uh, all of those are going to sell products to agricultural businesses wholesalers, retailers, or industrial users. Uh, and also large agribusinesses might send sales reps to end users uh, if the end users are large enough, if they can buy in bulk. Consider a stadium purchasing AstroTurf. Obviously, that's a big job that requires a knowledgeable salesperson. So why would you take a career in sales? Well, they pay dividends, uh, both financial and non-financial dividends. Uh, the benefits from a career in sales, whether agricultural sales or any other sector really come in both financial and non-financial forms. Uh, financial benefits involve anything that can be boiled down to money. This could include direct financial rewards like commissions or bonuses, but it 
also extends to things with monetary value, like a health club membership or opportunities for financial discounts. If it can be traded for money, or if it allows the recipient to pay less out of pocket for some activity like a gym membership, then it fits into the financial benefits category. Those money offsetting prerequisites uh, can include a lot of things, even company cars fit into that category, and sometimes they're hard to distinguish from the non-financial benefits. Non-financial benefits can be very enticing to some people in their own rights. We typically think of these as the psychological rewards associated with successful selling, but there's a few that we need to point out. Status refers to a salesperson's professional position. For example, being known as the expert in a certain area or a sales leader can be very exciting. Privilege involves having access to something that others in the company don't, usually something merit-based. This could be a key to the executive washroom or a manager's uh, private cell phone number so they can reach out uh, and have access without uh, having to go through other people. Power involves a level of influence a salesperson has, whether that's over uh, the salesperson's company uh, or over the buyer's decision-making process. A lot of people enjoy having uh, some sense of power. Merit-based incentives are the additional benefits that accrue to good salespeople or ones with good sales records. And those can come in the form of financial or non-financial benefits. All right, that's a good place to stop. Uh, and we'll come back in and talk about who should be in uh, sales career.